be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Woo, lively bunch, all right. My name is Christopher Weiser, and I'm one of the pastors here at First United Methodist, and we are excited to have you in worship in person and online. All right, we got a couple announcements. First and foremost, actually, it's going to be a quiz. There's going to be a quiz. Can we do a quiz this morning? All right, on October 31st at 5 p.m. at the Celebration Center, something's happening. What is it? Trunk or treat. Wonderful. Woo! Everybody passed. You all get A's. Uh, wonderful. Trunk or treat. Oh, wait. And kids are going to be expecting? Candy. 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 We are about 69% of all the candy that we need for 1,500 kids or so to come through uh, our trunk or treat, whether it's going to be outside or inside. Uh, we'll, we'll modify with the weather, of course. It's going to be an exciting time. We can't wait. Hey, our theme, by the way, is going to be the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. I bet you can't guess who Dorothy's going to be. <laughs> and uh, hey, if you want to present, there you go. <laughs> took a moment. Took a moment. Hey, uh, uh, and hey, if you want to join, hey, we need plenty more munchkins and flying monkeys. So if you, <laughs> if you happen to have a flying monkey costume, feel free to partake and join along. Uh, we are going to be taking a break this week from WOW, our Wonderful on Wednesdays, our... Um, um, We've been having these events at 6 p.m. Uh, at the Celebration Center. We're going to take a break, but then session three will get kick-started right back up the week following. There's plenty of classes and opportunities. There's things for the littlest ones to the tallest ones, youngest ones to the oldest ones, and so you are all invited and welcome to partake um, in Wonderful Wednesday. So that's not this week, but the next week thereafter, we will get rolling again. All right. This morning, we are going to uh, go over our memory verse for the morning. Uh, so I and the choir will go first, and then uh, as one church family, we'll say together. So it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. All right, together as one church family now. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Amen. Jesus now with grace and love. 
Let us pray. God of love and power, we come to you in this place to worship your holy name, to sing hymns to remind us of your goodness and your greatness in our lives. This morning in prayer, we probably came to this place with people on our minds, friends and family that may be going through some difficult times, and we want to take this morning to pray for them. For all those with physical ailments, who are maybe going through recovery or battling disease, we pray in our hearts and our minds, them by name. For those who are going through difficult emotional times, maybe wrestling with anxiety, fighting depression, or just pain, Lord, we just pray for each and every one of them. And so we take a moment to think of their names in our hearts and in our minds. For those whose souls are weak and tired, perhaps they've never even heard of the name of Jesus. Perhaps it's been a long time since they've said the name of Jesus. Who are weary and beaten down through the day-to-day -day activities and lost that passion for life. We think of their names in our hearts and in our minds. And so God, the God of love and mercy and grace and power, each and every person that came to our minds this, this morning, who we bring to you, we trust you with. We ask for your healing power and grace upon their lives, that each and every one of them would be healed and restored and brought into the fullness of who they are. We love them so much, and God, we know that you, if we love them, how much more that you do as well. And at all times, we look forward to the hope that you have set before us, the hope of the resurrection, the hope when all tears would go away, where all pain and sickness is a thing of the past. This morning we pray for First Baptist Church, our fellow witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have called them to a specific task to preach the gospel in a specific way that they may reach a specific people. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be upon them and that they would preach Jesus boldly each and every day in word and in deed. We pray for Smith, Smith Cotton Junior High, for all the students. In this season, there's going to be parent-teacher conferences going on, and, and grades are going to be released. And we pray that between the guardians of the students, the students, and the teachers, that wonderful plans would be created to enable each and every student to be successful through the end of this semester. We thank you so much for all the administrators, the teachers, and the staff for the work that they tireless they do each and every day. They are a blessing to this community. They are heroes. And we ask for your presence in their lives. God, you are good. Each day you give us life to live to its fullest. And then beyond this, you give us eternal life to be with you forever. We are excited. We are an excited people who live in the joy of the resurrection. And now we pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. give out of love that we have for God and for one another. Your generous giving enables us to do so many good things here in Sedalia and beyond. And for Sedalia, we love you. We're dedicating 10% of all of our tithes and offerings to uh, two uh, incredible nonprofits. And so the first and foremost is Mercy Rest Stop. It's not quite built yet, but they are uh, going to be providing emergency services as well as um, long-term services and to enable people to be able to restore their lives. And the second one is Child Safe of Central Missouri, which combats child abuse and, and trying to prevent it as well as to restore childhood hope for those who have encountered it. These are two worthy organizations that not only help here in Sedalia, but go farther out and farther beyond. And so your generous giving enables them to do that, do, do the work that they do, uh, as well as the work that we do as a church family. There are three ways to give. We have our joy boxes located at our entrances. Uh, there's a the safe and secure way to do it online through our secure give, as well as mailing gifts to the church office at the Celebration Center. And we thank all of your generous gifts in this season. If you are a visitor, please don't feel obligated to give. You are 
our guests. Ah, and the students can meet with Lancy. <laughs> because we don't have internet at Celebration Center. So we have had to go old school there. We didn't have any slides going, and I thought, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? So we're going to go old school here as well and not going to have any slides here today. But I do need your response. I'm going to ask you a few questions um, about ranking things, okay? So I'm going to list off something, and I'm going to give you two options, like uh, whether dogs are better than cats. And then you're going to answer, if you like dogs, you're going to go dogs, and if I, then we'll say cats, okay? So we're going to rank some things today. So first off, dogs or cats? Dogs? dogs. Cats. Uh, <laughs> all right, so now you've got the game. All right, so Ford or Chevy? Ford. Ford. Chevy. Chevy has won in every single service this weekend. All right. Sweet or salty? Sweet. Salty. How about anybody in the middle? Like a little bit of both. Like it mixed in. All right. Okay. Um, how about for all the farmers out there, John Deere or Case International? John Deere. Oh. <laughs> okay, the last one. Make your bed, don't make your bed. Make your bed, don't make your bed. <laughs> At our 8.30 service, we had a row of boys all from one family. They were like, don't make your bed. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to talk about ranking today. Uh, we rank a lot of things. We rank our college teams. We rank our places we like to eat, our cover bands. We have preferences, and we decide what's most important or what we like the best. And we're going to talk about that today and how it applies to the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. But before we go any further, would you pray with me? God of love, kindness, strength, peace, and an abundance of so many everythings else. You are all. And Lord, we ask that you speak to us today as we look at this passage of scripture. And Lord, would you speak through me? In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Now, if we had a Sedalia We Love You video going this week, um, you would see a couple of the areas of ministry that we do here at First Church. Now, each week we're focusing on the things that you do. You do these ministries through giving of your time, your talents, and your resources. And one of the things that we do through First Church is we provide snacks to 10 of our Sedalia 200 schools. And this is for students that come in, they maybe miss breakfast or they uh, need a snack in the afternoon. Maybe they're just growing and they need extra calories. 
Your giving helps provide to these students in our church, in our community. Another thing we do, and we're gearing up right now because we're heading into some cooler weather, that we have a long history of providing new school coats for students that are school age and are in need. This week, the letters went out to our um, schools in Sedalia and outside of our in Sedalia, Lamont and Green Ridge, Dresden, asking the teachers, the counselors, the staff to be aware of students need coats to let us know because we will buy them a new coat based on their need. So if you want to be spe specifically involved in the coat ministry, as you give your tithes and offerings at the joy boxes at each of the doors, you can give a gift that is marked coat ministry. And that will go to provide coats to our students within the community and beyond. Because our, we have a motto here at First Church, one of our community themes is we love kids. It's no secret. We love kids. And we show this by providing in these ways. You show this by providing in these ways. So we're going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, whether you're familiar with the story or not, you're probably familiar with the name, the Good Samaritan. Uh, we have a lot of non-for-profit organizations that are called the Good Samaritan. When people go above and beyond with their actions and caring for others, we call them a Good Samaritan. And did you know that in almost 50 of our states, we have a Good Samaritan law? And that protects people like me. If I come across a car accident and I go to help that person and in the, in the process of helping them, I break their thumb or something, that law protects me from um, people suing me when me trying to be a good Samaritan or to helpful to this person. So to give context to this passage today, we need to look at this with an Eastern mindset. The past, our Bible is an Eastern book. But we try to interpret through a Western mindset, so I want to give us some background. About 50 years before Jesus was born, there were two groups of rabbis that they had differing thoughts. They went through the scripture, they dug through the scripture to understand it. They wanted to rank the commandments. And they, be they believed that the number one commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. But they differed on what the second most important commandment once was one group says to be holy like God is holy. Don't defile yourself with what you wear, what you eat. Don't get near dead people. Like that would defile you. The second group of people said that the second group most important commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. Now when Jesus came, he brought a counter-cultural message. So people were always asking him questions and wanted his interpretation of the law, the first five books of the scripture, the Torah. And the passage we're going to read today has a man, it says an expert of the law, comes to Jesus and asks questions. Now, some translations will call him an attorney. That's a really poor translation. Because what he was, was a religious leader, an expert in the law, the Torah, and so this man comes to him to ask these questions of Jesus. Now, because we're old school today and we don't have any visual props up here, Pastor Christopher has helped me find four people who are going to help me act out the story of the Good Samaritan. So if you are part of those four that are going to help me, let's give them a round of applause and thank you and come forward now. All right, who are my four? All right, great. Okay, so we're going to have you start over here on the floor, just there on, the front, on this front, and then I, all you have to do is just act out the story I tell you, okay? You don't have to say anything, all right? So you guys are going to be a great asset to the, uh, the, the sermon today. So we have this expert of the law come to Jesus, and he says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Eternal life was not like heaven. It was how do you embody a holy life? And Jesus says to him, what is written in the law and how do you read it? He just turns it right back around on him. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength in your mind, and love the neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But this man wanted more. He wanted to justify himself. And so he says to Jesus, who is my neighbor. Well, here's the catch. At that time, your neighbor was your tribe. There were the 12 tribes of Israel, and you only really had to take care of the people in your family. 
And the tribes were so distinguished that they were even marked by how they dressed. It was, but you know what? If you didn't, weren't part of that tribe, you didn't have to take care of them. So this man is asking, what, who, or who is my neighbor? Now this is where you guys are going to come in and help me. Okay, so Jesus told parables and he used the surrounding environment to teach. And so these people are walking and they would have been walking down this road and the people would have been familiar with this surrounding. And so Jesus is using this surrounding to tell the parable. So they're coming from Jerusalem to Jericho in this parable, which would have made sense. They would have been coming from an area where they were trading, bartering, selling goods, being in the temple, and going, returning home. So, they come across to this man, and this is where it first begins. You ready? So you're going to be the first one, all right? So you're going to walk across this way, because you're going from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem. And it says, a man was going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. In walks the robber. <laughs> so, scripture says, yeah, so you have to be half dead. You're half dead now, okay? Scripture says he was stripped of his clothes, but this is a family show. <laughs> We're leaving it there. You don't, yeah, you stay there, buddy. All right, so, um, and they beat him and leaving him half dead. Now, when I was little, I remember hearing this story and thinking, they left him naked? Now, that's like my, right? Like, you know, like the Western mindset is like, oh my gosh, that tells us what, how badly the robbery went. But what was really, Jesus was really telling was there are no identifying marks to this man anymore. His clothing is gone, so you can't tell what tribe he's from anymore, so you don't know if he's one of your people. So we go on. It says, now a priest happens to be walking by, going on the same road, but when he saw them, oh, you're going to pass to the other side. Make a wide swoop. You're not going to have any part in him. <laughs> just keep on going. You can just go back to your seat. Just keep on going. Now let's talk about this narrow road. This would have been like a trail. And this is the way they were passing all the time from Jerusalem to Jericho. And where Jesus is using the surroundings that they knew. Now this is a parable, a teaching story. But Jesus would have been giving them information that they would have understood. He was coming from Jerusalem. He probably had just done his priestly duties in the, um, in the synagogue, or in the temple, rather. And for him to have stopped... And helped, it would have made him unclean. You can't mess with people that are half dead. That would defile him. What if he was a Gentile? You sure don't mess with Gentiles. And this would have been a risk for him. He would have lost maybe his reputation, his position, his time. So all of a sudden he starts ranking what he should be doing. And if he does defile himself, then the only way he can make himself right again is he has to find a red heifer, sacrifices burn the red heifer, use the ashes of the red heifer to purify himself, and he has to start all over. It would take him a lot of time. So he starts ranking, my time is more important than this person. But we can't really be too hard on him, because he travels this road all the time. I mean, he may have seen a lot of people being beaten and taken for their money. And really, if you think about it, how often do we see a car on the side of the road with their hood up and their lights flashing, and we just change lanes? So we can't really be that hard on him, right? All he did was change lanes. So then it comes to the Levite. That's you. So a Levite came to the same place, and guess what the Levite does? Passes by on the other side. Don't mess with him. Just make a big, wide sweep. Keep on going. Now the Levite worked in the temple. Served in the temple. It would be like Lori, leading worship, part of the worship. And maybe, this is what, remember, what Jesus is telling things of this story. The Levite would have known that the priest was walking ahead, and perhaps the Levite saw the priest ahead. And what the pre Levite saw was the priest didn't stop and do anything. So when the Levite comes across the half dead man, he's following the leader. He's not going to stop either. And gosh, what if he did stop? 
then it's going to make the priest look badly. So just take a big wide swoop, follow the leader, and keep on going. Now they would have anticipated a pattern with this story. Because this is how rabbis taught. They taught with stories. So it would have been kind of like three men walked into a bar. You know, it's that kind of story. They would have anticipated this. So he, they're ready for the third piece to come in. So they're listening and they're waiting. And then so Jesus says, but then a Samaritan. Hold up. You're the Samaritan, but hold on just one second. We've got to talk about the situation here. The Jews hated the Samaritans. It had a long history of a feud. It went back to the Old Testament, the Babylonian exile, where God allowed the Israelites to be taken over by their enemy because of their idolatrous ways. And King Nebuchadnezzar, in order to keep down the rebellion, to be able to oppress and overtake these people, he separated the people. Because a people, if they're not combined, they can't really rebel. You diminish the power when you separate the people. So some people were sent into Samaria, and then they started marrying Gentiles. Well, that was not what you would do. And then all of a sudden, the Jews, who were this elite group, have become a group that now have Gentile background. And the ranking continues. The Samaritans, the people from Samaria, are not as good as the other Jews. In fact, they even came, the Samaritans came back to Israel to help rebuild the temple. They wouldn't let them. They considered them pagans. They built their own temple. They took it a long way around in order not to go through Samaria. They hated the Samaritans. So they would have gotten, Jesus would have gotten their attention. So so now we're back to Samaritans over here. Charlotte, the Samaritan. She's traveling. We're going to change it to a she. She's traveling, and she comes to where the man is, and when she sees him, she takes pity on him. She goes to him, bandages his wounds, gives him a drink of oil or wine and oil, helps him up. You can help him up now. Helps him up. You get on her donkey. She's going to share her donkey with you, and she takes you to an inn, and she gives you money, gives the innkeeper money. There you go. There's the donkey. Woo! <laughs> You're the best dad men we've seen this weekend. <laughs> but they go to the inn. The Samaritan gives them money and says, Hey, look after him. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any of the extra expense you may have. The Samaritan sees a person in need, a human. They don't go beyond the moment of the need or anything else, but just sees the need in the moment, takes care of him, and then also commits himself to caring for him in the days ahead. Let's give our volunteers a hand. Great job. So the story goes on, and Jesus says to the expert of the law, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law says, the one who had mercy on him. Ouch. You notice he can't even say Samaritan? He just says the one. They, them, those, he, she, the ones. You know, it's a lot easier when we call them by a pronoun instead of their name. We don't have to pray for anybody if we don't know their name. We just can say they, them. When I was in college, I was in a chorale group, a singing group, and um, we were on tour. And we were going to the southern part of the United States. We were on our way to Florida. Now, I grew up in Clinton. Clinton's a little smaller than Sedalia, and there weren't any malls in the late 80s and the early 90s in Clinton, but boy, was it fun to go to a mall, to be let loose, to be able to shop and go inside and go to any store you wanted to, and pretzels and orange juliuses, and it was so fun to go to a mall. So we're on this college tour, 
And we were going to be staying in the homes of people in the community. We were staying, staying in like in music halls and churches. Well, we get to this community and it's earlier than they're expecting us. So they don't know what to do with a bus full of college students. So they take us to the mall. And we're all having a lot of fun because we're in a mall and it's the 90s. Well, we meet up with our host family that evening. And the host family from the South, she says, So what y'all do this afternoon? <laughs> I'm like, well, we went to the mall. Oh, I bet that was great fun. And I said, it was. Well, what mall did you go to? And I told her, and she says, oh, that's not our mall. It was a white woman. That's not our mall. They, them, that one. No names. And you know when this, this expert in the law simply responds as the one. You know Jesus could have pushed back. Jesus could have said listen son come on we need an attitude adjustment here. Let me explain something to you. But Jesus doesn't give tension to that argument. He doesn't pull back. He just lets it sit. I can imagine Jesus let that sit for just a minute. And then Jesus just says, go and do likewise. So what makes those three so different? And you know, it's, not, it's more than what they did or didn't do. It says the Samaritan came close in. He didn't go just walk by. But in verse 33, it says that the Samaritan took pity on him. In another translation, it says compassion. He came in. He saw that this was a human. He didn't see the rank. He didn't see the risk. He didn't bring in an opinion. He simply had compassion. And we read this word elsewhere in Scripture. Now, I'm going to slaughter this word, but the Hebrew word is phlegnesomai. And that word, when it's used, is, means compassion to the point that your stomach aches. Have you ever heard, seen something and it just makes you feel sick and you're like, oh, that makes my stomach hurt. I just, oh. But when we read this in scripture, it's always dealing with the God figure in the story. Typically the one that we don't suspect to do the right thing. But it's always surprisingly there for us. Drawn into the situation, not judging. There's no judgment just simply seeing the human and the need. And in every part of Scripture where we see this verb applied to Jesus, feeling compassion when he sees the people, it's always followed with action. During the bombing raids of Germany during World War II, there was a statue of Jesus, and the statue stayed intact, except for its hands were damaged during the explosions. And someone during that time came by with a sign and wrote the sign out that says, We are his hands. We are his hands. And this month in our, in our series, Sedalia, We Love You, our core verse for the month is Acts 1.8. It's Jesus saying, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Hold up, there's Samaria again. Jesus is addressing this area where the people are hated. But if you remember, Jesus went to Samaria. He got a drink of water in the hottest time of the day, and he met a woman at the well who was a Samaritan who confessed of the sins in her life. Like, that's a trifecta of shame. Samaritan, woman, and sin. And yet, Jesus spent time talking with her and reaching out to her, saying, there's no rank here. And Jesus was a witness as a leader to his disciples to say, you see the human need. Nothing else. Do you know, in this passage where the expert is asking the questions, wanting to know what he needed to do, if you're like me, he was just wanting more information. I tell you what, I ask tons of questions. 
I ask so many questions. I'm, I, on, the, on the Strength Finders personality, I'm an information gatherer, and I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And when I first came to this church, I had to make a deal that I'd stop asking so many questions because I asked so many questions. <laughs> but we do that. We ask questions when we want to figure something out. But, you know, I think really the interesting thing is the questions that keep us up at night are not the questions that we know we don't have an answer to. It's that we already know the right thing to do, but we're ranking it. It might cost us our friends. It might cost us some money. It might cost us our reputation. It might cost us our time. Like, what if we ask somebody how they're doing, and they actually tell us, and it takes us more than five seconds? And then it might draw us into taking care of them the next day and the next day. It might slow us down. But every time we rank what we should do, we're ranking love and we slow down the flow of love. Who is our neighbor? <laughs> Surely we don't have to go to the hard places. I mean, I can love the people around me. I can love the people in Sedalia. That's where I go to church and the people are kind of like me. And people, my friends would understand if I'm helping the people in need around me. And I could even go to Judea because that's not too far out. I'd even go to the ends of the earth because they don't even know me there. But to go to Samaria? To where the people I don't like that aren't like me? Or worse yet, how about going to Samaria to the people that don't like me? We can take care of the people we don't like. But what if the person doesn't like you? You know, this week, two times I was told that a person did not want to work with me in ministry because I'm a woman. I'm called to love those people, and they don't like me. I'm called to go to Samaria. Who is our neighbor? We have to keep our context in place when we're looking at Scripture. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, our core verse for this month, Jesus is giving these instructions that when you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, you'll be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is giving this instruction at his ascension. He's been crucified, he's come back to life, he spent time on earth, and now he's going. He's going back to heaven. And these are his final instructions, those important words. You know, when you're leaving the house in the morning, you're out walking out the door, and you're like, it's trash day! Or like, hey, don't forget to feed the dog! Or, hey, I forgot to tell you I'm going to be late! Or, hey, turn on the crock pot! It's those important things that we holler out just before we leave because they're important. And just as Jesus is getting ready to leave, Jesus says, don't forget about Samaria. Go to the hard places. Go to Samaria. And this, a mess this is a message of hope because we've been the Samaritans at times. Scripture tells us that we were an enemy with God before we knew the, the love of God. And as I was looking at passages of scripture this week, I came across this Old Testament passage in Jeremiah where, the, where God is talking about King Josiah. And it says, King Josiah defended the cause of the poor and the needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, says the Lord? To love the poor and the needy is to know God. So the question that the expert asked was really not who is my neighbor, but really who is it that I have to love? And I think it's interesting that Jesus didn't finish that conversation by telling him who is his neighbor. He returned a question with a question. He said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The Samaritan was the neighbor, but you can be the neighbor. You can do the hard things. You can show the love. 
Because the question wasn't who's your neighbor, but to whom must I become a neighbor? You know, I love the understanding of the root words in the academic translations of Scripture, the NIV, the, even King James sometimes, NASB, you know, NRSV, like to understand the core words of the Greek and the Hebrew. I love digging in and understanding that and get a fuller understanding of what is meant that's sometimes lost in translation. And in John 1.14, it says, The Word became flesh, Jesus, God became flesh and dwelt among us. But there's another um, translation out there. It's the message translation, and it's an easy reading language. And if you read John 1.14 in the message, it says the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus, becoming a neighbor to all. Christ in me, a neighbor to all. Would you pray with me? Powerful God, we need your power within us to teach us to love. It's easy to love, but it's also the hardest thing to do. Lord, would you teach us how to love those that we find hard to love? Would you teach us how to love, Lord, those ones that don't love us? Lord, would you build your kingdom through First Church? Would you truly empower us to be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Lord, lead us to the hard places so that we may be your hands and feet of Christ. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Pastor Christopher and I will be at the front while we sing this song, and if you would like to have someone pray with you, we invite you to come now.
for the world. I believe the Lord will bless us and keep us. I believe the Lord will make his face shine upon us and will be gracious to us. I believe the Lord is with us in our going out and in our coming in, in our laying down and in our rising up, in our labor and in our leisure, in our laughter and in our tears, until we come to stand before Jesus in that day when there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen.